Amir Hussain has been a decolonialist all his life <laughs> without knowing it perhaps. I don't know whether this is true of his childhood, but it certainly defines his writing life. As we saw in some of the lectures yesterday, in Amit Chaudhary's and Devoshri Mukherjee's, for instance, Chaudhary calling for a change in the framing of the argument of the decolonial project, linking it as much to the market in 1989 as to a history of empire, and Devoshri Mukherjee in her call to decolonize the idea of the human, we see that decolonization is much more than the arithmetic add, subtract, or cancel in which it has been given to us today. When I say that Amir has been a decolonialist all his life, I mean that he has stood against the wind that has created market-oriented commercial careers for writers in the Anglo-American publishing world. Through his writing, the choices of genre and aesthetic that he made in them, he has showed us how it is possible to live in shorter forms, the short story and the fragmentary, and how it is possible to be a major writer in spite of writing in what the market now considers minor forms. Brought up in Karachi, Amir Hussain moved to England when he was 15. This was in 1970. Over the last 10 years until the pandemic, he spent much of his time working in Pakistan. He is a bilingual writer whose notable works include collections of stories such as This Other Salt, Insomnia, Love and Its Seasons, 37 Bridges, and Zindagi Se Pehle that was published last year. He has also published two novels, Another Gulmohar Tree in 2009 and The Cloud Messenger in 2011. In 1990, he edited and introduced Tigers and Butterflies, a collection of Han Swin, occasional non-fictional prose. 1990, 30 years later, he's still championing her writing as a literary activist. Amir will be talking about Han Swin's cultural activism for Asian writing, particularly in English, her own self-declared homelessness, and her gradual resurrection as a maverick and even iconic presence on the margins of post-colonial studies. It's very good to see you, Amir. Good to see you, Jamuna. Okay, thank you for that rather, um, what can I say, wonderful introduction. I'm gonna start with some blurbs of uh, on the back covers of Hans Huyen's last few books, including the one that we did together. Now, this one I'm translating directly from French, and I'll tell you a very funny story about it, which is that in 1993 or four, she gave me this novel, which was about a man whose daughter gets murdered, and he goes off with a Swiss detective from London to Thailand. And it turns out that all this is uh, connected with the smuggling of artifacts which conceal drugs. So it's a completely wildly hybrid novel, you know? combining a suspense, some mystery thriller, uh, social comedy and various things. But it didn't find the British publisher. Her publisher was Jonathan Cape and had been for 60 years or so. But Cape didn't take it. I think the new guard didn't like it. So the book ended up in a French translation, which is called Le Soleil en Embuscade, so The Sun in Ambush with the English title. And just to tell you what the French publisher said about, I'm translating directly, so uh, forgive any mistakes I make. Uh, this grand police, uh, Roman policier detective novel is inspired by the grand uh, British tradition. And Hans Egan has decided to surprise us because she's not talking to us about her China, but about ourselves, of our brilliant and decadent Europe which is destabilized by chômage, uh, unemployment, but deeply rooted in its traditions. So there we go, the dichotomy immediately. Uh, Han Su Yin, the voice of China, representative. If she talks about Europeans, if she talks about globalization, if she talks about the fact that the East and the West, Switzerland and Thailand are connected in a, uh, in a trade of drugs and illicit uh, artworks, all that, must be somehow showing Europe to itself. But who is this we that they talk about? 
I mean, Hansi is half Belgian and living in Switzerland. She's also half Chinese and representing China in many markets. Okay. We'll go to the slightly more modest description in the biography that uh, was in the book that we published together. But I can see even 31 years later, 32 years later, that this biography has been tampered with because uh, the publishers were actually development studies, not literature, because it was turned down by two literary publishers. So born in China in 1917 to a Belgian mother and a Chinese father, Han Suyin was educated in Beijing and in Brussels University. She worked as a midwife in Sichuan province during the Japanese invasion, later completed her medical studies at London University, graduating in 1948. She then practiced in Hong Kong until 1952, the publication year of her first major literary success, A Many Splendid Thing, and subsequently worked in Malaysia until the 1960s. She's the author of several highly acclaimed novels and autobiographical works, and her work has been translated to 17 languages. A leading authority in contemporary China, the late Bertrand Russell, wrote, during the many hours I spent reading Han Suyin's books, I learned more about China in an hour than I did in a whole year spent in that country. So uh, he's a leading authority in contemporary China, having lived there for one year. She has always maintained an active involvement with other areas of the third world. She lectures regularly and has written widely for medical journals on family planning in the third world. Now, we wouldn't be using the term third world because Han Suyin didn't use it. She talked about the developing world. And when anybody said anything about the third world, she used to turn around and say, oh, you mean the two thirds world. Uh, so that's one thing. Then we get world famous as a writer. Han Suyin is a historian, polemicist, and educator. And the essays that we collected cover Desertification, the continuing dominance of the North over the South, the rights of women, of immigrants, and of indigenous minorities, birth control, and the elimination of disease, the politics of aid. So we have that. But interspersed with these essays are also comic stories. One is about the time she spent living in an Adivasi village in Odisha with her husband, who was an engineer, and how there's going to be this huge big dance, but it's somehow subverted by something because the, the, the uh, the tribal, the villagers are annoyed with uh, the outsiders and how there's a union strike of women and how one of the women then runs away with Han Suyin's Muslim cook. So, I mean, it's really Asia upon Asia with no Europe except two Englishmen sitting there, you know, as, as neighbors. And then there's a very poignant story about the misuse of Islamic divorce and how she knows the, the, the right uh, rules but that the woman who's actually been divorced arbitrarily and summarily by her husband doesn't. So this was by way of introducing you to, to a writer whose name has been forgotten, erased, invisibilized, to use that uh, term uh, that, that Francesca used, but how her reputation is now being reestablished between Leeds and Singapore. Now, Singapore is a place she lived in for 12 years. And uh, her only book that I believe is in print in English is And the Rain My Drink, which is about the um, freedom struggle in, in what was then Malaya, Malaysia now. So there is uh, a book length volume, which was first commissioned here by uh, a publisher, mainstream publisher, and because of COVID, it was passed on to the Journal of Postcolonial Writing. So it's coming out as a journal. Nevertheless, there is this attempt to bring her back. And it's Singapore of all places uh, has, has, you know, uh, readopted her that, uh, as it were because she actually left there under a cloud at some point which she was never quite able to explain to me nevertheless it's great to see someone claiming her because a chinese writer who wrote in english and felt that english was the link language for all of us to echo much of what francesca said she said to write in english didn't mean i can quote widely from her own writings to write in English didn't mean either excluding our own languages or to cut ourselves off from our cultures. Quite the contrary, it meant enlarging other people's uh, knowledge of our cultures, talking to each other. Her, she wondered how Asians could write or talk to each other without using English or another linked language, since we were so ignorant of each other's languages. Uh, she never advocated French, which technically was her mother tongue. As a, as a linked language, I think it just wasn't important enough in Asia. And yet she said she thought, thought in Chinese before she wrote in English. So she very eloquently has written about that in an essay that uh, she wrote for this conference that I'll tell you about. 
and that was called Asian Voices in English, which I attended 21 years ago, 31 years ago, and uh, where I gave my first public speech and was teased mercilessly for my obvious difficulties in delivering it was what I was told later. <laughs> but so there we go. So she got this idea that she would bring together various writers who wrote in English from the Philippines, from India, from most of them turned out to be from the Philippines and India, but there were also Bangladeshi writers. There was, I guess I was representing Pakistan, uh, more than one writer from Malaysia and Singapore. And uh, so some of the speakers there were Nand Dara Segal from India, whose paper unfortunately is not included in the book for copyright reason. There was, I think, Bienvenido Santos from the Philippines. There was Richard Kim from the States, but of Korean origin. There was Catherine Lim, who was Singaporean, a very good short story writer who had not been published in England yet. So a lot of us who were meeting there were not writers who were published by big houses and in the West at all. We were in, published in our own countries and had very little access to each other's work unless it was published you know, in, in, in the Metropolitan Center. So she herself, as someone who was always published by the center, was trying to decenter all this. And she said rather ambitiously that her model was the Bandon Conference that she had attended in 1955, actually in the month I was born, which uh, was, as you know, about uh, non-aligned nations and neutrality and so on, to try to cause, uh, to make a bridge between uh, nations that excluded strict ideologies of left and right. Okay. Uh, I'm going to look at a list of topics that we were given for to, con to contribute to the book of essays about her. I hope I can find it because, yeah. Uh, now, the conference was called, and this magazine reflects that. Literature, Culture and Translation, the Second International Symposium on Hansu Yen. Uh, cultural Translation, Border Crossing and Mobility, Country and Nation, Cold War Writing in English and Asia, Feminist Studies, Ideology and Civility, Intellectuals and Politics, Memories and Life Writing, Migration and Diaspora, Race, Class and Sexuality, transnationality and diversity. Now, I was talking about this to an anthropologist friend of mine yesterday, and she says, well, this does look like something from the social sciences, not literature. But since Hans Huyen herself was a doctor, she probably has said, yeah, well, you know, it's okay, all these things are interlinked because she always talked about society, politics, economics, and culture being part of a spectrum. So in fact, that spelled spec. But she would have found some of these labels rather pompous. In other places, she would have looked at something and she said, well, yeah, I was doing that long ago, like Cold War writing in Asia, uh, in English, uh, in, in Asia. And I'll talk there about this novel called The Four Faces that she wrote in 1961 or 62, which is about an intellectual called Gyan. We never quite find out where he's from, but he's from somewhere between uh, Vietnam and Cambodia who visits Cambodia for a hilarious writers conference, which is attended by Mulkraj Anand and Minu Masani in masks, of course. One is called Chandra Das and the other one is called, uh, what does she call him? Um, it'll come back to me, but it's very clear. Oh, Muni Multani. And it's also got quotations from Fez, which she's done herself. Who told her these Urdu poems that she then translated Safina Ramedil? In, into English. These two guys are constantly arguing about the rights and wrongs or the rights and lefts of world literature. And peace is pitted against, uh, you know, peace is the left wing attitude. And uh, what was the right wing thing for the time? Freedom, of course. And again, there's the drug smuggling thing going on between East and West. So some of the people attending this conference are actual carriers of drugs as well. And there is a suspense uh, theme. And at the end, what emerges is that one of the people attending the conference is actually an Algerian freedom fighter. So she brings together Vietnam and Algeria, both countries in the throes of decolonization, one recently decolonized in Cambodia, which was free, and Algeria, which was still under French rule. And it was something that she deeply felt about. She later visited Algeria 
And I want to come to this notion of civility. Again, I was talking to my anthropologist friend Gwen, ben, Gwen Berniet about this yesterday. So um, intellectuals and politics, ideology and civility. So I think I've touched on intellectuals and politics there as well as Cold War stuff because her novels often combine both. So with civility, she was telling me about how one has a certain mode of attacking or you know, mini aggressions and so on and so forth. And Han Suyin herself was deeply, deeply, deeply attacked by many, many people for her pro-China stance and then for her changing stance and then for uh, not speaking out about the Tiananmen War, which completely excluded all the other things she'd done. It excluded the fact that some of her novels, which I'm going to talk about, have really got very little to do with China. If they have to do with China, it's as a diasporic Chinese or uh, emigre Chinese, etc. But she herself made a very, very, very delicate critique of Camus, which she voiced through the words of an Arabic scholar who had written about Camus when she visited Algeria, which she really loved and spent a lot of time there with Algerian people, perhaps two months, I think. And that man, whose name I, I forget, I'm sorry, I, I would have to look for it if I, and, and stop ruffling and shuffling. Uh, actually had written about Camus claim to be Algerian and the fact that he was completely oblivious of Algerian freedom, that he didn't know Arabic, et cetera, et cetera. And she, I can see, subscribes to that and has reread Camus in that light while she listened. She doesn't make her own comment. But what I'm saying is that she was incredibly civil about and two other writers, except one or two that I heard her in private, you know, berate, including one certain uh, very famous permanent cosmopolitan uh, of Indian origin. Uh, it, it, from A to Z, she couldn't stand anything he had to say outside his books. She said, why doesn't he just keep writing? And why doesn't he shut up with his travel? But that would never have gone into print. So that notion is there. Okay, memory and life writing. Uh, after writing her six or seven novels, Hansi in turned to writing autobiography in the mid 60s. And that was when the Chinese reputation arose. And that's where I also see the shortfall in the biography that we wrote, that, that we allowed to be published at the back of the book. Because rather than mentioning a many splendid thing, which I'll come back to in a minute, they should have mentioned the fact that for a lot of uh, readers in the mid 60s, Han Su Yin was the crippled tree, birdless summer, a mortal flower where she was pitting her own background against uh, China's struggles, ongoing struggles with modernity, and constantly showing us how this ancient culture was being transformed for better and for worse, how certain things had to die, how certain things had to change, and other things were being lost in the process, which was her constant argument during communism as well. That, you know, there are certain things that had to go, other things were lost, for example, the beauties of language or art or objects were destroyed and, and so on. So she was never completely pro what was happening during the revolution. She just felt that she was saving a lot of lives by doing it. That's her life, that's her personal business, which I'll leave aside. But in her books, this is what she was advocating uh, as, as far as I could see it. But it did mean that the novels from Southeast Asia were erased for many years, though they stayed in print. And when I come to this title of, um, or the subtitle of what I was going to say, is it the title? Yeah. Uh, on not teaching Hansa yet. Every time I design a course, I teach adult students since I retired from university teaching at the age of 60 uh, at a small literary institute. And I am asked to present three different course titles every year because I teach 30 weeks a year. I love it. It's just a way of talking about books I love. And to come back to Francesca's lovely presentation, it's world literature. I don't always call it world literature, but I like to bring together as many different kinds of books as I can. So Shum and I would like to be teaching your book along with, I don't know, a book that's been written by a contemporary in Britain. But I have to find ways and justifications of doing it. You know? So for example, once I taught something called uh, trans, transnational fictions. And in that I had both Arundhati Roy and Han Kang I had Mirza Vahid and I had uh, Yi Yunli from China, et cetera. But you have to find a way of doing it. So what's transnational about some of them? The fact that they're translated. I'm not doing writing that's only in English. All this follows something that Han Su Yin did when she taught a course many years ago in Singapore, 
called uh, Contemporary Writing in English in the context of emergence from colonialism because the phrase post-colonialism wasn't around. So she had to, as we say in Hindi, you know, she had to beat her head to find this phrase. And she found this. So she was teaching Iqbal, Tagore, Fez, uh, Mulkrajanand. Uh, I think she got hold of Gugi Wationgo when he was called James Gugi and taught him as well. And bringing together a group of Chinese, Indian, Malay writers uh, in many languages. At that time, the notion of writing in English, or Anglophone writing, hadn't entered her head in quite that way that it did later, because I think she was just aware of the intractable problems of uh, bringing together so many languages in translation when they just didn't exist. Uh, Francesca very eloquently spoke about Pramudian and Tatur being available. Han Suyin was very fond of uh, Najib Mahfouz's work and you know, read a lot of Arabic stuff in translation and other languages because she was also very good with French. So I followed in her path and did that. And I've done, let's say, for example, fictions of the Raj and uh, you know, post-national Indian writing, fictions of partition, comic writing from Britain in the 30s and 40s, post-war writing, international writing in, in uh, uh, sorry, uh, post-war writing in Europe in, in many languages and translation. Han Suyin would fit into almost any one of those categories. Fictions of the Raj, she's written about the Raj. She's written about Nepal. Expat fictions, she's often written about herself as an outsider in many cultures in which she lived. Um, transnational fictions is, of course, exactly how she would have defined herself had she been alive today. She used to call herself homeless because she had a home part of the year in China and part of the year in Switzerland, and also spent a lot of time in London and a lot of time in Bangalore because her husband's family lived in Bangalore. So she was in and out of Bangalore in China. So transnational, but why can't I teach Hans again? Because her work doesn't exist. I mean, at a literary institute, you can't get people to go to a university library and draw the very rare copies there are of her work there out. They want books they can read. They want books they can read on Kindle or they want books they can buy at the bookshops. 30 years ago, you would have found most of her books on the shelves. This erasure was largely to do with the fact that her reputation as, uh, as an advocate of Chinese um, hegemony or of uh, communism was, uh, became very unpopular. And it became particularly unpopular with the rise of uh, anti-Mao books and autobiographies and so on and so forth. But again, forgetting that so many of these books were nothing to do with um, ideology uh, or, or they were to do with conscience, they were to do with courage, they were to do with, yeah. Uh, decolonization very often was a theme in the books, but they weren't political histories, they were novels. Let's start with a many splendid thing. That's where we get the life writing beginning. That's a hybrid novel because the heroine is called Han Suyin, but Han Suyin's name was not Han Suyin. It was uh, Guan Hu Do, and she was known as Elizabeth. So um, to, to her Anglophone friends, she was Elizabeth. So Han Suyin is an invention, but then it became her pseudonym. That book reinvents people's names, but it tells a story not of a love affair exclusively, which those of you who've seen that awful film might think the, the, the awful film which is misnamed love is a many splendid thing whereas the book is called the many splendid thing which is about life not love it's about a woman doctor widow with a little girl that she's trying to bring up and the little girl has to be in boarding school for much of the week and comes back at the weekends she's very ha often hungry because she works long hours at, at the hospital uh, she can't go back to China because she's not allowed to, or you know, that she's still very worried about entering China because she thinks she might get bumped off. That's what she's being told. So she goes in through the back door twice. Uh, it is then about the way she falls in love with a married man, and she does not want to fall in love. But then she thinks of Madame Butterfly, and is it Susie Wong or something like that? She says, oh, all these stereotypes of these women. And later on, she says, well, you know, in that story, I was the agent. I was the one who was pulling the strings. And the truth of that story is that if that man had lived, that love affair would not have gone on because I was destined for other things. 
Then she writes And the Rain Might Drink, which I'm sure other people will have read and might be able to talk about. Uh, kind of in between autobiography and fiction, because there is a character called Hans Wien who walks in there, who is a doctor and attending hospitals and doing all kinds of things. But then from an aesthetic point of view, it's quite radical because she disappears and appears and reappears and disappears and then goes into the jungle and looks at revolutionaries in the jungle. It looks at politicians, it looks at business people, at business people, all fictionalized vignettes of, of, of uh, their lives. So in a sense, it's her bravest book and her most radical book because it's quite uh, disjointed and fragmented in a way that at the time wasn't fashionable. And the only, to talk about Western influences, the only influence that I've been able to uh, attach to that particular book completely by fluke is the fact that she was reading Nightwood when she wrote it, Juna Barnes's Nightwood. And one of the chapters is named after one of the chapters in Juna Barnes's book. <laughs> Though probably if you'd asked her, if she remembered it, she would have said no. But she was asked then in Singapore if she would teach English literature. Would you like to work at Nanyang University? And she says, yes. And they said, would you like to teach English literature? And she says, no, I want to be the college physician. And they say, but why not English literature? You write in English, you could retire from being a doctor. She said, no, I don't want to retire from being a doctor. My patients need me. And I don't want to teach Dickens and I don't want to teach Thackeray because I don't come from English literature. I've never studied it. I don't know anything about it. I've read it, but I don't know anything about it. And she could often be disingenuous in that way. So why don't I teach instead, you know, emergence from colonialism? And she gets up and, and teaches this stuff, you know, which is not being taught by anyone at the time that I know of. And then moves beyond it like she moves beyond everything else. Okay, so we've done uh, out of chronology, we've done a many splendid thing, Four Faces uh, and the Rain My Drink. Then the mountain is young is set in Nepal and India. And it's basically uh, in some ways uh, a fictionalized retelling of her meeting with her Indian husband and how she fell in love with him. But as in many of her novels, what she does is she takes the whole Krishna, Radha, Rukmini thing. Uh, in many of her novels, she uses myth and legend and so on and so forth. So she takes Krishna, Radha, Rukmini and this Western woman who's writing part of the book. Sometimes you see her in the third person, sometimes she's writing a diary is the Radha figure because she's married. And the Rukmini figure is taken away from myth, but they both envisage Unni, the hero who's black skinned as, as Krishna. So she uses that and at the same time, she's targeting feudalism and all kinds of things. So there's this ent entertaining dimension as well as you know, uh, a dimension of uh, critiquing what she thinks of as obsolete practices. In a lot of her work, you'll find a deep understanding of Buddhism and underlying uh, what she's writing, particularly Southeast Asian Buddhism, not Chinese Buddhism. Where she got that from, I don't know, but it's, it's very deeply there. And then comes the other novel that was reprinted at a time when her novel started to disappear. You get this little book called The Winter Love, reprinted in the mid 90s. I've got a copy here and it's published by Virago. So we think, ah, Hansigan has been claimed by a feminist press. Finally, somebody has given her a place outside China studies. Uh, she's not accepted by the British establishment as a British writer. She's not Chinese because she writes in English, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So she finds a place as a feminist writer. Yeah, but it was lesbian landmarks, which she found incredibly amusing because it was you know, a novel about the love between two women. But she says, so Virago picks me up, but they can only see this particular aspect of what I wrote in this book and nothing else. That it's a post, that it's a wartime book, that it's about women, medical students, that it's about, again, uh, struggling in a grungy city. And that's a British novel. So for once, Han Su Yim was on home ground in some funny way, writing about something that she knew very well. And uh, even that has to be slotted somewhere. And that book again, of course, went out of print. Um, talking about this kind of cross linguistic relationship or a South-South relationship between languages and literatures uh, and the use of English, there's a very funny moment in a many splendid thing when she says something to her lover and he quotes to her from Flaubert. 
And she turns around and she says, no, I was quoting Shen Fu, uh, Six Chapters of Floating World, which is much, much older, yeah. Haven't you read it because he could be Chinese? So she's kind of mystified that he flings Flaubert in her face when she's quoting Shen Fu. And this was another element in her work. It was imbued, as, as a friend of mine once said, uh, it's organic, not displayed with references to Chinese literature, Chinese culture, Chinese poetry, Indian stuff frequently, as I said, Buddhist stuff, it was just there. Okay. Critically, Han Su Yin did do what she jeers at one of the writers in her books for doing, or he jeers at himself. She did visit countries for a month or two and write about them, in, write novels about them as an outsider, as, as a, enthusiastic visitor. But the problem there is that sometimes the outsider's gaze does fall in places in a way that could almost be tantamount to uh, exoticizing it or uh, glamorizing it or being you know, um, patronizing. Uh, I think she was aware of that. And that also brings me to the fact of you know, books that are written perhaps to give a face to an entire people or to a culture uh, uh, that are published in the West, because they can then be seen as, you know, being voyeuristic. I don't think that was her intention, because there was always something subversive at the end of it. Uh, like, for example, in The Four Faces, it turns out actually to be in you know, about decolonization in all kinds of ways. So there's always that kick in a very vulnerable place at the end of the book. But at some points, you know, you go through these markets and these monuments and so on and something beautifully philosophical comes out but it can almost appear to be uh, voyeuristic or as i said patronizing verging on exoticizing stuff um, the other criticism is that for some reason she and it's not even a criticism it's an observation for some reason most of her books she felt the need to have western protagonists and this is something that other writers from South Asia have told me, contemporaries of hers, younger contemporaries from the 60s, that they were told that if you put a Western character in one of your books, in, in your books, the book will be more saleable. And I don't know if this was something she was told, but she frequently felt the need to do this. So in the Four Faces, for example, the minor characters are European, but the main characters are male and Asian. And I think that works extremely well, possibly because I can identify very deeply. But for example, in The Mountain is Young, to go back to that book, she's also talking about a woman's body and sexuality. So we come back to this race and sexuality thing. And it's you know a European woman and an Indian man. But there are things like a scarred body, the decision not to have children after a uh, miscarriage, et cetera, et cetera. And, uh, a partial or temporary inability to have sex. All these things were not being discussed in 1958 in fiction. I think this was much before the Golden Book, probably a decade before the Golden Book. Shumana, you might know. Um, so people thought this was, you know, they would call it a romantic novel, but what's actually going on there is much more than a romantic novel. Uh, I think I've said a lot, is it time for questions? Uh, would you like to continue? I, otherwise, okay, uh, we could have uh, Q and A then. I, I think I've gone through quite a lot of the stuff I promised, haven't I? And maybe okay. this is time for people to to bring in their perspectives. Or... Sure, um, Amir, when I'd written to you asking you about you know sending me a short abstract about what you were going to speak about, um, you you used the word third world literature and said that how it had become an obsolete category now uh, in relation to her work and therefore the difficulty of kind of placing it. Uh, would you share your thoughts about this terribly named category, the hilarity of that name and what its successive names might have been or might have, uh, you know, what are the names in which by which it exists now you think? Shimona, I can't dismiss it because I'm a product of that particular label. Uh, simply because I started writing for a magazine called Third World Quarterly. 
and my literature, uh, my, my, my literary editor was Maya Jaggi, who's a well-known journalist and uh, critic now. So we both come from that fold. For us, it meant meeting writers from Latin America, Africa, without the post-colonial category, without the abominable Commonwealth category. Uh, so in that sense, as a Pakistani living in Britain who also loved reading in Urdu, uh, it, it suited me better than Commonwealth or post-colonial. It was, a, as, as Suyin said, it's, it's one of those empty categories. You could fill it the way you want to. And she herself, as I said, wouldn't talk about third world literature. She didn't even talk about world literature. She said literature is literature. But then she would sometimes talk about Asian writing in English. What has replaced it? I think world literature is the closest we can get to it after having heard Francesca's very eloquent presentation. Why but did you think it became obsolete? Because the third world ceased to exist as a category when the second world disappeared. It was a political naming. And for, um, for the West, China was included in the second world, but China included itself in the third world. But with the second world gone, what do we have? We can't have a first and a third world. I mean, that's how I look at it. Maybe it's just very pragmatic. So, I mean, what would you call it? Uh, literature from developing countries that would be so much worse <laughs> so, you know we get stuck with regional categories as well and when i go to pakistan i'm always asked uh will you talk about pakistani writing in english and i say but why would i talk about pakistani writing in english why can't i just talk about pakistani writing to cook you know i read in three languages or just talk about good writing or talk about a writer so, I mean, categories are categories, and they mystify me, and they baffle me, but sometimes you just have to put up with it. So, does that make sense? Yeah, of course it does. And I'm thinking of the presence of world, you know, in world literature mm. and third world literature, and why does that have to be a prefix to kind of talk about literature at all, when yeah, literature yeah, by yeah, itself, yeah. on yeah. itself, is a world yeah. unto itself. Uh, I also want to ask you... Well. Yeah, yeah, I also wanted to ask you about uh, literary translation and how mm -hmm. she sponsored, along with the Writers Association in China, uh, right. an award. Yeah, That's so because right. we're you know speaking or discussing yeah. this at yeah. a literary yeah. activism Sorry, I forgot to mention symposium. That. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so would you say something about her literary activism? Yeah, she was very, very keen on that. I mean, this uh, the literary activism I was mentioning was doing all that teaching also uh, running a magazine in Hong Kong quietly, for which she wrote articles that I collected in this book, which uh, spoke to other Asians. They were, you know, uh, east facing, if you if you like, articles about her visits to America, or Algeria, or discussions and topics about, you know, various things, including the piece about India. And then she set up the Hansuyan Scientific Fund, uh, with which I collaborated briefly with her for a while, uh, just to help out. And then there was a Hansuyan uh, translation prize, uh, which is now run by her foster daughter. And she okay. thought that was extremely important. I mean, all forms of translation were extremely important. She herself translated poems from the Chinese under the pseudonym of Miranda, which perhaps I shouldn't give away because it was a big secret, but I don't think she'd mind anymore. Yeah, so she used to translate classical Chinese poetry. Um, it was extremely important. That's why I said that, you know, when she started to teach contemporary Asian writing, it wasn't just writing in English, it was writing in translation. But she did talk about the paucity and difficulty of getting good translations. Right. And she also said that when Chinese writers were translated, there was a kind of eye to a certain market when they were translated, and they weren't translating the best of them always. She read a lot in Chinese. In fact, maybe more than she did in English towards the end. Okay. Uh, I hope you'll read the comments. There's a com comment by Francesca, which was in response to what you were saying uh -huh. about <laughs> literature from developing countries. And um, so she says, is it because of Frederick Jameson's essay? There's an there's a comment by Peter McDonald who says, great talk and answer uh, on both occasions. Yeah. 
can't see. Yeah, that's, can... that is why I'm reading uh, them yeah. for you. I think you can't see them. Yeah. Great talk and answer on both occasions. Much more to discuss, says Peter. And Devoshi, she has to leave. And she says that she wish she could stay longer to discuss world cinema. Um, because there are no questions uh, yet, I wanted to know just from for curiosity's sake, um, she, I think she spent a decade in India. Uh, no, on and off, uh, half her life. Okay, did that impact her writing? You think? Oh yeah, um, yeah, 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 yeah. She wrote a uh, she wrote a memoir called The Share of Loving. She married into a Tamil Christian family, and her son had their step her stepson had meningitis. So it's about how she, as a stepmother and a doctor, actually. Uh, looks after and helps to rehabilitate this young man. So it's entirely set in Bangalore, or mostly set in Bangalore. And then it has something about the community that her husband came from, which was, I think, uh, from uh, from Chennai, where I first met you. But uh, I, yeah. she believed they belonged. They were originally fishermen, and had converted to Catholicism. So it's about India. It's about Indian Christianity. It's about a uh, role as a wife and a mother and it's also about parenting and uh, equal partnerships in marriage. Her books always do all this kind of stuff. But yeah, she loved India passion because she could get very angry with it as well. She personally admired Nehru a lot. And I think she had this habit that, you know, very often, if we can say we Asians, which she liked to say, have of comparing our countries with another country and we set up a, an imaginary rival for ourselves. So she would say, India has got it right, India has got it wrong, India has got it right, India has got it wrong in comparison with China. Really? And she enjoyed Indian writing very much. Can you guess which her favorite Indian novel was? Anyone can, if anyone can guess, I'd be delighted. Shubir wants to guess, I think. Yeah. Shubir wants to guess? Oh, no, I don't know. Please. I, won't okay, I was just you. teasing you. Yeah. I think um, Amit Chaudhary has raised his hand. If, yes, I don't know sorry. whether that means I must stop. Uh, or... I, I, I was wondering if I could ask Amir a question. Yeah, it's Alan Seeley Stratanama. Uh -huh. ah, okay. He loved that book. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, but maybe I should uh, just read out. I will ask you the question, but Peter McDonald. Uh, I think is what the letters P M C D uh, stand for. Uh, has um, a has question. a question. I'm going to just read that out, and then I'll come back and ask my question. So his question is: Han Suin has been forgotten by the publishing world. Has she also been forgotten by universities? Um, and yes. and my, yes. my uh, question was related to that, but I'll come back to it in a second. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, yeah, she has been forgotten by universities. But a few pioneering people, first in Australia, began to resurrect her reputation. And now the University of Leeds. Uh, there's a very good um, scholar called Alex Tickle, who's actually you know, brought me back into the fold of Hansui and studies, which is a new genre, you know, new field. Otherwise, I've just, you know, I've written a personal memoir of her a few years ago, and I thought I was done because that was, you know, about my friend Elizabeth. It was not about the grand condam of. Uh, Asian literature, as they used to call her, the leading uh, lady of, or, yeah, leading lady of Asian letters. Uh, so yes, I think there'll be a slow resurrection of it, but where are they going to place her again? Because yeah. university disciplines, as you all know from having taught literary courses, actually need a category. Right. So, I mean, is she post-colonial? Not quite, because China doesn't quite fit in. Will she fit in as someone from Malaysia now? There's been this kind of uh, resurrection of her, somebody who uh, lived there for 12 years. Will she ever be seen as a British writer? No, though she had a British passport for much of her life. Uh, I look at Kazuo Ishiguro and I think of how Amit will remember, because he was a young student then, how uh, Remains of the Day came out. Uh, people said it's so Japanese. Do you remember? Um, sorry, when Remains of the Day came out. Yeah, people, the critics said, oh, this book is so Japanese. Uh, uh, yeah. Um, so, you know? 
I remember that. I was that. <laughs> anyway, um, so uh, can I just say? Uh, yes, please. After you, Francesca. And there's a comment from a student. Uh, yeah, it, say, it looks like, as Amir says, one needs different frames rather than labels or uh, category. That becomes a kind of decolonization, then, doesn't it? I mean, yes. Sorry, if I can, ask, if I can ask, can I ask my question? Yes, so yes, this yes, is please, Francesca. Question. Which was to say exactly yes, you know, that. And I'm going to answer you in Hindi. Ah, very good. <laughs> so that, you know, it's almost like uh, the, you know, maybe we should shift from, uh, you know, label. Label is something really, or category yeah, is something yeah, that yeah. really imprisons. Yeah. And then frame instead, you know, often, as you, as you were saying, one needs multiple frames to understand yeah. somebody, yeah. you know? You, you know, one frame alone doesn't, doesn't yeah. do it, you know? So, so then if we think of frames, then you think, okay, what, what else do I need to know in order to understand her? Yeah. Or what, and maybe something relates to one frame and then yeah. something relates to another frame. And from what you're saying, I mean, I'm afraid I haven't read any of her work, which shows, you know, it's, uh, you know, yeah, uh, it seems like she's, uh, she's sort of um, playing with uh, or, or, you know, mixing elements that otherwise we would expect to be in quite different kind of genres. Later on, they started One using different frames. Huh? word carnivalesque, but when she describes some of her work, she says, you know, all uh, comic opera misses the high note, and that's what I like, the missed high note. She describes her work in very untheoretical terms, but she gets out these things that people would later say, you know, in university classrooms. She said, my work is a mixture of the comic and the grotesque with the tragic. She would keep on saying that. And then she would talk about, I mean, the, one of the loveliest lines she's written is a woman writer from Thailand who says, uh, why should I sit in my garden and, and just, you know, contemplate my navel when there's a lot going out in the world out there going on out there in the world that I can share with and I think this was her that she wrote out of this urgency to write but when she couldn't do it in fiction she just wrote essays prolifically the essay the novel for her was a genre that she enjoyed and then who she was would come through or her current preoccupations would come through in the novel and you know, then how do you classify her? And when you asked her, she said, well, I'm Chinese and I'm a writer. I don't know if I'm a Chinese writer or not. So. Uh, I'll just uh, read out Mastura's comment. I've seen as that. Someone, do read you, that. You can see that? Okay, yeah, great. Uh, for those that. who can't, yes. As someone from Singapore, I have surprisingly no question on Han Swain. Amir has spoken about her so well. I just wanted to say hello from Italy to friends Amir and Shumana, and to add that the symposium which I followed over these two days was excellent. Hi, yeah, Mastura, and well. thank you. Yeah, I think uh, let's go in this order. There's a question from Amit Chaudhary, then one from Eleka, which I'll read out, and the next one from Peter again. Yeah. And, and all yours. And then we, we, we'll have to sort of maybe yeah. make this session. Right. Um, Am I allowed to smoke in this room? Um, yeah, yeah, that's fine. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, yeah. Questions, questions. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, uh, so, Amir, I, I, I remember you telling me with, I mean, it, you, you were quite aghast, but, but I remember you telling me that, do you know that Hans Swin's books are her publisher has dropped her and her books are out are going out of print yeah uh, so i can't remember the date for this conversation but it would have been in the 90s sometime yeah yeah is that right yes so so uh, and i remember the look of shock on your face distress felt, yeah distress and i felt shocked as well um because I knew of Hansu and I hadn't read her. I mean, she was quite well known in, in Britain. And she was um, loved by Indians and Pakistanis and Bangladeshis more than by British readers. Yeah. Right. Well, around that time, I did know from my tutor, the, the South African novelist, you know, my tutor at UCL, Dan Jacobson, he was saying to me sometime in the 90s, kind of sadly, that um, my books will become print on demand, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so, so, um, so there was a moment going off uh, uh, of offloading uh, authors, authors who seemed to be, as far as critical reputations were concerned, 
very established writers. Uh, but 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 cultural capital suddenly didn't count for anything, uh, in, sp in in spite of lip service being paid to yeah, yeah. Uh, to uh, uh, cultural capital continued yeah. to be paid lip service to. But actually, in the hard kind of reality, um, it didn't count for anything at all. Pe people were being fired, as it were, you know. Um, and and I, I remember saying, writing to Marina uh, Marina Warner after after she wrote her piece about quitting the university in 2014 she said you know in the lrb couldn't take it anymore had to quit i remember asking her we can quit a job but what do writer writers can't quit they, they continue being writers no. you know um so i'd like to ask you a couple of things i mean what 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 was changing then hanswin was for me the first kind of instance of that change which, which would happen and I which I don't think that the outside world still knows very much about but it, which is endemic in the world of publishing yeah, yeah. secondly um, how much of yourself do you see in Hansuin of your trajectory I mean hmm. in what ways are, 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 are the lives our lives connected as writers, as practicing writers in this milieu. When I say you, I mean myself, others. Yeah. yeah. What ways is she relevant to us today? Yeah, relevant, relevant to us, to and, and a, a, in a kind of way, echo, echoes us. You know, yeah. I mean, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, I can tell you. The first question was about what makes a writer disappear, in a way. So she yeah. disappeared. It was a, it, hers, hers was an ideological bias. It was that no one was interested in the crippled tree after Wild Swans came out by Jung Chang. That was, you know, who came from the same town as Hansi and his parents, in fact. So she's covering similar ground in a way, except, you know, 50, 40 years later. There was an ideological bias, and then people ceased to see the novels that were not about China as being, you know, even good entertainment, which some people saw them as. Also, she didn't tick the feminist boxes well enough. Were they selling enough armor? I mean, that is the basic question. I think they did sell for quite, I mean, they stayed in print for 35 years. Maybe they don't, they, maybe they weren't selling anymore, but when they weren't selling anymore, it was because Han Suyin was no longer this voice of China that people wanted her to be. Because I think the, the other novels were, stayed in print on the back of the Chinese autobiographies, which were considered to be masterworks in their time. You know, and I, I was old enough to remember that. And the second one is, what do we see of ourselves in her? I see a lot. I see her teaching has probably had a bigger influence on me than her actual writing, because she was a novelist, and I think I might have told you. She used to keep on saying, oh, these short stories, it's, you know, it's a fleeting genre, it's like catching a butterfly. And then when she read my first book, to which she wrote an introduction, she wrote the most lovely introduction and said, you know, I've come to understand what a short story can do. But she took pleasure in that. She taught me to look at the world in a many, many, in a multifaceted way. For one thing, she told me once I was writing something about our colonized mentalities and, you know, oppressive regimes and those of us who live in Britain because our countries are oppressed. And she basically wrote me a letter, I wish I had it here, saying, shut up. You're living abroad. That's it. You come from Pakistan. You can be Pakistani as long as you like. Your mother is always your mother, even if she's ugly. These were her words. And she says, you're you, whatever you wear, whatever you don't wear, you're many things. We've all come from many places. We've traveled from one place to another. No one belongs to only one thing. And yet we can be rooted in our culture. She forced me to read Urdu, which I didn't read. So you were talking about the decolonization process. You know, I read English and I read Italian and I read French. And I read Indian writers in English and Pakistani writers in English. I taught myself Urdu. She would be so proud if she saw that I was writing in Urdu. She also said, always have another, um, you know, uh, string to your bow, bow to your string. She would probably love to turn that upside down and joke about it. But she says, do something else. I actually love teaching. I always have. I don't really like writing criticism unless I'm really enthusiastic about it. I reviewed for money for many years. I hardly review anymore. I enjoy writing a column. Now, that kind of thing, too. She said, keep different genres for different things. Express yourself in different ways. Uh, it was, I mean, the salutary lesson was that you can be a writer and not be completely caught up in the machinery, even though she had huge, you know, good, good amounts of money and good sales and so on and so forth. 
she uh, kept her medical practice going for many years. Much of her lecturing was to do with medicine and not to do with, uh, or, or later on to do with things like uh, desertification and, and social problems, social sciences, uh, all those things. I think, you know, she was a hard act to follow. But I think we can also learn from her that reputations are perishable, but works are not. Somebody will continue to, to like that work. I think Kamala Markande has recently been resurrected. I don't know if you know. Yes. Uh, through the good offices of Pete Ayrton. Nowhere yes. man, because it's about a British Indian migrant. So yes. slowly her books are coming back in print and she was a close contemporary of Nancy Andrew. But you see, again, there's, there's a reason to reprint her. In Britain, there doesn't seem to be a reason to reprint Hansi again. I myself don't have a British publisher anymore. Uh, I mean, they, my, my backlist is in print, but I haven't been asked to do a new book in five years, six. I have a Pakistani publisher whom I'm extremely happy with. And people keep asking me in this wonderstruck way, but don't you want to publish your book in Britain? I say, if somebody wants it, they'll find it. You know, Somehow they'll find it. So... Uh, all these things, there's so much, so much. But I just open her books and I find that there's so much about, you know, uh, literary skullduggery and vanity and reputations and, you know, people edging each other out of certain seats, uh, about notions of identity, about mobility. An internal argument goes on with me about nostalgia and her, you know, I argue with her about that to this day. I say, I, I say you called yourself homeless, but you were always longing for China. So why was I always told to shut up if I felt that I had lost something? And then finally, I realized I hadn't lost it because I started living in both countries like she did. Or like for a while you did on it. You know? So, yeah. So I think at a human level, I learned a lot from her. And she always said that her books were about what she felt. There were novels um, of ideas. Are, sorry, sorry. Yeah. That's a, that's a, yeah, you know. yeah, there are two questions. I'll come to Peter's question uh, right at the end, and that'll be the last question. Uh, there's a question from Eleka Bomer and Rukmini Bhaya Nair. Hi, Eleka, and hi, Rukmini. Eleka's question, they're related, and therefore I'm reading them together. Yeah. Eleka asks, fascinating presentation and discussion. Thank you. All these la labels, world, post-colonial, third world. I agree they're not very helpful or accurate for writers, but they're not there for teachers and educators to teach and promote this work as the sense of what is central and normative. What is out there is so very different in the West, stroke global North, than it is out there. Rukmini says, while the idea of world literature remains mystifying in many ways, the idea of a world language, for example, Esperanto, has been widely discussed and has been both longed for and laughed at in equal measure. For example, eco, the search for a perfect language. A counterfactual question, what would Han Swin have thought of the idea of a world language? Appalled by it or intrigued? I think she would have been intrigued, but I think that she had more or less taken English as that world language because she insisted more than I did that in Asia, English had been appropriated by people who used it. So I, there's a lovely quote, which I, if you give me time, I'll read it. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Just so many good quotes from her, but, uh, but this particular one, I think answers the question exactly. Uh, if you can just carry on and give me the next question, I'll find this quote while, while you... Okay, the last question. Uh, ah, for this, uh, okay, yeah. you read it and then uh, from Peter, yeah. I do not see English as de debilitating one's own native language, nor as an opposition hindering one from using Chinese or Malay or Hindi. I see it as the international vehicle most effective in accomplishing the task to which every writer is dedicated, i.e., in rendering the unfamiliar and the unknown accessible to all, removing the barriers of ignorance, interpreting for a world audience the wealth of our own culture, so the world world comes in, our modes of feeling and thought. And by so doing, we Asian writers who use English are overturning the dogma 
whereby only European American writers anchored in their own culture took it upon themselves to write and speak of Asia and the Asians creating stereotypes, etc. And then she talks about how she actually uh, thinks it is only tr too true that my English derives its unconscious roots from Chinese, chiefly from Chinese poetry, which is responsible in producing a new rhythm and sentence construction in certain of my books. And she said the same thing about Indian writers. She said they very often use patterns that are unique. And she also castigated some people for being what she called dainty mimics of Jane Austen. Uh, she couldn't stand that. She said when Indian writers you use words like twittering and uh, other words like that, onomatopoeic words, she hated it. One more short quote. But it is the English language that we use in all its extravagant splendor, its monstrous capacity of growth, acquisition, and inc incorporation of words and phrases and concepts uh, that, that bring us together. So there we are. Her answer, and I think that she says it is, you know, as far as she's concerned, we have to shoulder it. Like, as you know, we were, we were talking about earlier, I can shoulder third world, and Elika says we find these labels in order to be able to promote the kind of work that we want to teach. Um, and the last question. Yeah. The last question is by Peter McDonald. What about the agency of literary writing, its capacity to reframe things? Well, that's that lies at the root of everything. That lies at the root of everything. But what do we call literary writing? One, and two. Once we've done the reframing, how is it going to be accepted and by whom? And I answer you know personally and uh, subjectively. How do I become a Pakistani writer in English? <laughs> What's that process? Because I'm writing what I write, you know. So it's not just in the eye of the academic or the salesperson or the publisher. It's also in the eyes of the reader. Readers are now so conditioned to slot you. You know, you're a this writer, you're a that writer, you're a this writer, you're a that writer. Not just a good book that's been written by, you know, someone who has a particular cultural context, a particular cultural depth and richness in their background. But they must be circumscribed by that and not allowed to escape. Right. Thank you, Amir. It was really lovely to see you.